right, let's see where are we at. We are in the Gospel of Mark. Anybody shocked this morning? Uh huh. Well, if you don't understand, what we've been doing is we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. We're waking our way through there. We are in a study called and titled Be Amazed. Um, the reason I titled that is simply because that's what I want us to do. I want us to be amazed again at Jesus Christ and what He has done, what He has said, and in fact, what He has done for us today. And so that's where we are is in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 3 this morning. While you're making your way there, I'll remind you where we left off. The last time we were together, I preached a message titled, The Heart of the Issue. The Heart of the Issue. And in that, we got to see the truth. And the truth is simply this. The heart is the issue. Our hearts are the issue. We are so guilty so many times of looking at this world and looking at all the failures and the sins of this world and the darkness and the corruption. We get upset in politics and crime and all that. The storms, all of it. And we, we need to realize the truth. And the truth is simply this. It's all right here. Every bit of it. It all begins right here in the heart of men and women. It is our own hearts that are corrupt. It's our own hearts that start all of it. And then it's like an old saying that I was taught in Bible college that yet but by the grace of God, there go I. It's only by God's grace that I haven't fallen to the lengths that others have fallen to. And so I see that it's our hearts that are truly the issue. And in that passage, we looked at several hearts. The first heart was the heart of the Pharisees. We saw that all they wanted to do was critique. All they wanted to do was criticize. They, they were so stuck in their own traditions that they didn't ever see the truth. And so they saw Jesus' disciples walking along a road, plucking heads of grain and, and rubbing it in their hands and eating the grain. And how dare they do that on the Sabbath? And so Christ had to remind them of a story of David and his men who ate sacred bread that no one but the priest was allowed to eat. And the reason why is simply because they had forgotten the heart of the law. The law was not there to be a hindrance to man, but to be a blessing to man. It was there to show us the truth. It's like I, something I had reminded the, uh, the Sunday school class that I was in. Everybody gets so upset over the laws and they see God's laws as restrictive. I do not see God's laws as restrictive. I see God's laws pointing me to what could really be something wonderful. What could be something great. And I'll give you a prime example. When I was a younger man, I, wasn't, I was always seeking the next girlfriend or seeking the next joy that I could get out of a drug or out of a bottle. I was always seeking something. And the reality is, the greatest joy that I could ever have in my life was what God had planned for me. And if I would just simply find the one that he had for me and be faithful to my wife and be faithful to be the father to my children, be faithful to the church body that he had planted me in, be faithful to his word, I would have greater joy than I could ever find in this world. His law is not restrictive. It is there for us. It is to encourage us and to give us the greatest joy, to give us life fulfilled as Christ had promised. And so the heart of the Pharisees had missed this. That's why when they saw a man there sitting in the synagogue that had a crippled hand, they, they literally were using him as bait for Christ to see, did, would he heal this man? Would he actually do good on the Sabbath? There we saw the heart of the Pharisees willing to criticize Christ because he was willing to do something good on the, Pharise on the Sabbath. But immediately it says that the Pharisees left, got with the complete opposites of them, the Herodians, and they started planning Jesus' death. Started conspiring right there together. So you see their heart versus the very heart of Christ, which is what we looked at next. The heart of Christ was simply to do exactly what he said he was going to do. He came to heal those that were sick. He is the master physician. And just as I pointed out in that text, that, that even though Christ has already proven by this point in the Gospel of Mark, he knows their hearts. He knows the intent of their hearts. He knows what they're thinking. He knew that they were going to use this to be against him, to oppose him, and to plan his death. But it did not matter because when it comes to Jesus Christ, he is still willing to have us reach out to him and still have, be there to heal us regardless of the price that it costs. 
because he gave his life there upon the cross of Calvary knowing full well the suffering he was going to bear. And he did it because he loved us. Because that's why he came. And so we see the heart of Christ willing to be the servant, willing to love and to serve. We see that. And we saw the heart of the crowd last, where we saw people coming from all over the land now. They are coming from everywhere. And the reason why is because people were telling people about what Christ was doing. And that's the heart that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to be so overwhelmed, so amazed with Jesus Christ that we cannot contain it. That when we go to the restaurant, everybody says, well, look out. Here comes Shoal Creek. They're going to tell you what happened today. They're going to tell you what they learned today. But when's the last time you went to a restaurant and you had somebody come tell you what had happened that day? I promise you, had it been following the iron bowl, you would have heard somebody talk about it. What about after Sundays? When you've had an encounter with Christ, where you've seen someone's life get changed, where God has spoken to you through the message or through prayer or through a Sunday school message, when, when, when do we share it? When do we give our excitement to others? That's how the word spread so fast. It's because the heart of the crowd was amazed and they were consumed with Jesus Christ. And our hearts ought to be as well. This morning's message I have titled, Wanted actually wanted i put it on facebook to give a little bit of a teaser to get people excited and know where we we're going this week and i put on that everybody knows what it's like to be wanted i know what it's like to be wanted it's a wonderful feeling it's a wonderful feeling to be sitting there and like this weekend when my daughter's playing a basketball game and she, she looks up into the crowd. And why does my daughter look up into the crowd? She wants to see her parents. She wants to see her mama. She wants to see her father. She, it, I feel wanted. I feel wanted when my wife reaches out to me. I feel wanted when my parents come. I, I feel wanted and desired and it makes me feel wonderful to know that I am wanted by my Savior. That I am desired. We live in a world that, man, we struggle and we fight so much. We even, they, they, they put all this stuff on there so we can change our appearances and make ourselves look even more glamorous because we want to be desired. We want to be wanted. The truth is God wants you just the way you are. He doesn't need to Photoshop you one bit. Because the truth is, he knows your heart. Is that funny? <laughs> it's pretty good, ain't it? He, he photoshops me all the time, I promise you. That, that's funny. In our passage today, our passage today, Jesus chooses 12. He's got a multitude following. But he picks 12. 12 men are going to be his apostles. Twelve men are going to be his disciples. He's going to pour into these twelve men's life what it means to be a disciple of Christ, an apostle. It basically makes them emissaries. They become diplomats. And if you know anything about ambassadors or diplomats today, they have a special right and a privilege. They get to go before kings and rulers and queens. They get to go before the leaders of nations. And when they go, they are a literal representation of where they're coming from. When they speak to the ambassador, it's like they're speaking to the leader of the nation from where they've come. And that's what he is calling them to do. And that's what he's calling us as followers of Christ, as disciples to be. This is the world I live in. But this is not my home. I've got a home that is being prepared for me. And I am living here to live out my place here on his authority and in his power. I'm his representative here to show them how great and wonderful my home truly is. And so when you walk around moping or upset or having that scowl that some of us are guilty of having across our faces. Does anybody really want to come from where you're coming from? No. I come from a place 
where I serve a prince of peace. I come from a place where he gives me life and life more abundantly. I come from a place that he gives me joy, joy that is not of this world. And that is what I represent here in this world. And so when things go wrong or things go south or sour, I can sit there and react in a way that everybody is like, man, how in the world can you handle that? Because you don't know my king. One of these days, my king will make it all right. And my king told me that in this world, I will have trials and tribulations. But there ain't nothing this world's ever going to take from me that he ain't going to give back. Learn who we represent, and that's what we see today is the men that he calls to be disciples. We're going to be in Mark chapter 3. We're going to read verses 13 through 19 this morning. Verses 13 through 19. And I'm going to ask that if you have the ability to, to stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy and perfect word this morning. Starting in verse 13 of Mark chapter 3. And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted. And they came to him. And he had appointed twelve so that they were, would be with him. And that he could send them out to preach. And have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve. Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, and to James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Bonerges, which means sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, Iscariot, who betrayed him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come and to read your precious word. Father, your word today is really a list. It's a list of twelve. And I ask that you would do something today through the reading of your word and the proclamation thereof to help us to never look at a list the same way again. Because in this list, we find the blessed hope of Christ. And I ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. To be wanted... You know, if, you, if you're ever sitting there, many of you have probably seen the old wanted picture to where our United States government really wanted people to come and to serve in the military. They wanted you to understand that you were wanted, that you were actually needed. That if you are going to enjoy this land, this freedom that you have, if you enjoy your home, if you wanted to protect it, you are wanted and you are needed. It wasn't something that everybody would sign up for because it's going to cost you something. But you are desperately needed and you were desperately wanted. Because if people did not rise up, if people did not come and join, we would lose everything that we have. I want you to understand this morning that you are, in fact, wanted. You're not just wanted to be a part of the United States military. That's not what I'm talking about, per se. What I'm talking about is that you are, in fact, wanted to be a part of his army, to be one of his soldiers. You are wanted to go and to represent him. We all are. And so in this passage, we see 12 that are picked. But why were they picked? Well, the passage tells us. Verse 13. And he went up on a mountain and he summoned those who he himself, what? Wanted. Christ desired them. 
So you may be wondering, Brother Mayla, how in the world did you come up with the title of your message, Wanted? That's it. Because I couldn't really get past it. These men were wanted. They were desired of Christ. And it's not like he sat there and picked them because of how good looking they were. Or because he desperately needed them because of their talent. But they were so skilled at what he was going to need them for that they, he had to have them. That's not why he did it. He did it, one, because he prayed. We, we see that in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 6, 12 through 13, Luke said this. It was at, that time, at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. See, Christ didn't just flippantly pick 12 men out of the multitude. He didn't say, all right, you, 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 and you, y'all do good, come on. It's not how he did it. He prayed. He sought the Father's will, and he sought his guidance on who these twelve were. Because again, Christ had a multitude of people following him by this time. There are tons of people he could pick. Why these twelve? Why does he just pick these guys? What is special about them? What is it that they have in common? And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the twelve. Who are these men? Number one, first on the list, and you know he had to be first, it's Peter. We know his name is Simon. He is renamed Peter, which simply means rock. Christ gave him that name because it was Peter who first mentioned the fact that he was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah that had been promised. What we all love about Peter is that he gives every one of us confidence. That when we open our mouth and say something utterly stupid, God loves us still. Because Peter stumbled over his words more than anybody else. He was always bold. He was known for talking. He was known about being a little braggadocious at times. And he would say things that he just shouldn't have said, like when they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and they got to see Christ transfigured before the eyes and the kind of glory of God is there and he's shining brighter than the brightest white, Scripture says. Peter goes, man, let's just build three tabernacles here because Moses and Elijah were there too. They appeared and he said, we're going to build three tabernacles. We're just going to stay here the rest of our lives and worship you. Is that really why Christ came and was going to give his life so that we could sit on a mountain and worship him? No. Nor did he come and die so we'd sit in a church building and just worship him. We are called to go and to serve. He had to come off that mountain and get back into the real world and be the light and salt there and tell people what he'd seen. It was Peter. Do you realize that Peter was one of the only ones that rebuked Jesus? Can you imagine? Looking at Jesus and saying, uh -uh, Jesus, you're so wrong. You're not supposed to die. Just, just hush your mouth, Jesus. Can you imagine? That's what Peter did. After he named him Peter, after he had made this great confession of being the Messiah, that's when he corrected Jesus and said, there ain't no way you can die. Not only that, it would be there at the Last Supper where Christ would say, one of you are going to betray me. And Peter says, I, I would never betray you. And he said, oh, Peter, you will betray me. He said, no, 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 Jesus, I will die for you. These other fools, they may betray you, but not me. And he said, oh, Peter. By the time the sun rises and that crow is crowed three times, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what he did. That is the apostle Peter. He was the outstanding leader. He's mentioned more than any other apostles there in Scripture. Then you've got James. James the Greater, as some refer to him. James was a fisherman. James had a twin brother, and we'll talk about him in just a second, by the name of John. 
But he is James. James is the first to be killed for his faith. He's the first of the twelve that will die. He will be ran through with a sword there in the book of Acts. James was there with his brother. His brother was younger. James was older. We know that his, their parent, her, their mother, was there at the crucifixion of Christ. And it's interesting when you do a study and you start looking at all the different accounts of the Gospels of who were these women that were at the cross of Calvary, you'll see, and you put it all together, that James and John's mother was the sister of Mary, which makes James and John first cousins to Jesus, which becomes more understanding. You know that James and John had the audacity to ask Jesus to sit at his right and his left hand when his kingdom came. Not only that, they got his mama, their mama, to go to Jesus and ask for that. Well, that makes perfect sense. Some random woman coming up to Jesus asking for that honor would not be good. But if it's his aunt, that makes a lot more sense. Because I'm apt to do something when my aunt comes walking up to me. And so she had already approached. They're called the sons of thunder. One of the reasons why, if you've ever been with a brother, what do brothers do? Ask my mother sitting right there. I think she replaced more furniture in her house than anything. Because we were basically two giant bulls wrestling all the time. And we broke everything. We argued and we fussed. But one of the reasons why they were named Sons of Thunder is because that there was a city in particular that the city did not receive them. And James and John looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, why don't you just call thunder down from heaven and destroy that wicked city for denying you? That's the kind of attitude they had. Just destroy them. Get, wrap them off the face of the earth. They don't want nothing to do with us. Sounds like the kind of guy you want on your side. You got his brother, John. John wrote the Gospel of John. He simply never called himself by name. He called himself the beloved disciple. He was the beloved one. Now, I'll let you read into that how you want to read into it. He authored five of the New Testament books. Through church tradition, he is the only one that did not get martyred for his faith. Now, you may think that John got away with something. He actually lived longer than most, not only because he didn't get mar martyred, but also because he was the youngest, most likely, of the twelve. He lived longer. But don't think just because he didn't get martyred that he lived a great and wonderful life. No, he had hot molten tar poured all over his body. He survived it. Then they throw him on the island. And they just leave him there on the island. And that's where he begins to write his letters there from seclusion. That is John. Then again, like I said, they are part of the sons of thunder. Then you've got Andrew. Andrew is one of those that you just sort of wonder about at times. You know, Andrew was one of the first to follow Christ. If you looked at it in the Gospels, he's one of the first ones to come and to follow Jesus. And Andrew had a brother, and he, he loved his brother so much, he went and got his brother to come follow Christ, and his brother was Simon or Peter. Every time you look in Scripture, Andrew is always bringing someone to Jesus. You look at the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, he is the one that brought the little boy that had his Lunchable that Jesus multiplied. You could go and look at the time where there were some Greeks as well, and they didn't know what to do with the Greeks, and it was Andrew who took the Greeks to Jesus. He's technically the first international missionary. Andrew's always bringing someone to Jesus, but we don't see him mentioned that much, even though he was one of the first, and the ones that led the most to Christ. You got Philip. Philip, along with Andrew, was one of the first ones. And Philip, along with Andrew, was a follower of John the Baptist. They were there when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
They were there when John said of Jesus that I'm not worthy to even tie his shoes or lace up his sandals. That while I've baptized with water, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Andrew and Philip are the ones that went and followed Christ. And it was Philip that went and found Nathaniel. Philip is another one of those that are interesting. We, we do see him there with Andrew most of the time mentioned. Even though it was Andrew, Andrew that brought the boy with the lunchable. It was Philip that first was asked by Christ. They said, here are the 5,000, you feed them. It was Philip who said, there's no way I could do it. A year's salary could not feed that many people. It was Philip that had the Greeks approach him in the first place, asking where Jesus was, and he had to go find Andrew, because he didn't know if he could bring the Greeks to Jesus. That's who we see about Philip. Then you've got Bartholomew listed here in the Gospel of Mark. He is also known as Nathaniel. Nathaniel, we, we don't know that much about other than this. There's a, there's a potential he didn't think that much of Nazareth. And the reason why is when Andrew came up to Nathaniel and said, We found the Christ. It's Jesus of Nazareth. He said, Man, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? He just didn't think that much of the little town. Many of you remember that when I was preaching through that, I made a comparison to a local city in Alabama. I will not repeat that. That is who Nathaniel is. But we also see him say this about Nathaniel, that he was a man of honesty, a man of deep religious convictions, because to convince Nathaniel that he really was the Son of God and understand that it was Nathaniel that was one of the first ones to declare him to be the Son of God. It was at that calling that he did so because Jesus said that he saw him praying. And then if you remember from that sermon, he gave a quote from the very scripture he was praying over. He said, look, a Jew with no deceit. And so he was an honest man, a devout man. That is who Nathaniel was. Then you got old Matthew. Matthew is also known as Levi. We've already talked about him. It was just a couple Sundays ago. Levi was the worst of the worst. Levi was the tax collector. And we discussed tax collectors had their own set of sinners. You had tax collectors and sinners. They were so bad they get their own category. They stole from their own folks. That's how they made money. They just took extra taxes. They were the ones that traded, tur or turned on their own country. They all ultimately worked for Rome. And so can you imagine having a traitor there with you? Levi gets the name most likely because he was apart from the tribe of Levi, which is where it was the high priest and all the priests would come from. Levi wasn't even doing what he was supposed to be doing. Instead, he turns on his own country and is robbing his own people. He truly was one of the worst of the worst. But yet that is Levi. We don't see much mentioned about him other than that. Then you get old Thomas. Now let me tell you about Thomas. Thomas is the one that most of us are all going to have to apologize to. Because how do we know Thomas? Thomas the what? Oh, see, now you're really going to have to apologize. Because you said it. Do you realize that all the apostles doubted? It was the ladies... The ladies that first saw the risen Christ, and they came running to the apostles to tell them that Jesus had risen. Do you know what Scripture says? That they all believed. No, they didn't. None of them believed. You do see Peter and John take off running to the grave to see it for themselves, but they did that because they didn't really believe. Even though Jesus had told them time and time again he was going to raise from the dead, they didn't believe them. Thomas wasn't there when Christ appeared to the disciples the first time. And he didn't believe. And so he is forever remembered as doubting Thomas. But the truth is, they all doubted. Every single one of them. It was Thomas who actually made a very bold statement. If you remember the story of Lazarus, where God raised Lazarus up out of that mountain after he'd been dead for several days. None of the disciples wanted to go to Lazarus's 
death simply because it was right outside of Jerusalem. And they knew that they were probably going to be captured, that the priest wanted to kill Christ. And so none of them wanted to go that close to Jerusalem. But Thomas is the one that stood up among the twelve and said, let us go and let us die if we must. Thomas was a very brave disciple. He just had a moment to where he didn't believe, just like most of us have had a moment of doubt. Then you've got James, the son of Alphaeus. Many know him as James the Less, but I'm because there's another James. So you've got multiple James. So you've got James the Greater and James the Less. The reason why he's probably known as the Less is because he really didn't have that much of a prominent role. But what we do see is some possibilities. You'll see that a James is mentioned as possibly being a brother of Jesus, and many know him to have been the leader of the Jerusalem church. There are some that consider James the son of Alphaeus Alphaeus, to possibly be that James. I don't really believe that. But some do believe that. There are some that believe that his mother is also there at the cross. Also, there are some that believe that he is actually the brother to Matthew or Levi because you'll see that his father's name was Alphaeus too. And so you'll see that there's some possibilities, but the reason why these are all possibilities is because it just simply doesn't tell us nothing about him. He's just James, son of Alphaeus. That's all we know. We don't see him doing much in Scripture. You've got Thaddeus. Thaddeus is also known as Jude or Judas of James. Again, there's possibilities. Many of the ones don't refer to him or the Gospels don't refer to him as Judas because they didn't want him to be confused with Judas Iscariot. So they called him Thaddeus. But he's also possibly the author of the book of Jude, and the author of the book of Jude is a brother of Jesus. And so it is possible that he is a brother or a half-brother of Christ. But again, all this is speculation because we simply don't know. There's nothing said about him. There's no clarification on him. We don't see him having a prominent role in the Gospels at all. you got Simon the Zealot next. Do you know what we know about Simon? That. That's all we know. Literally. His name. Now his name does tell us a lot. He was a zealot. And a zealot just simply means that he was a part of a Jewish group that swore. They had a knife on them. Every zealot had a knife. And they would swear by that knife. And remember in scripture you're not supposed to swear by anything. But they sweared on that knife. That they would either kill a Roman or they'd kill a Jew that served the Romans. Well, guess who's one of the twelve? Don't you think they got along real well? Simon the Zealot was very zealous for the Jews and the tradition. And he is a follower of Christ, but that's all we know is his name. Then you've got Judas Iscariot. We know a lot about him. He's mentioned last, and there's a reason why he's always mentioned last. Because he's the traitor. He is the one that kept the money. He had the money purse. And so the reason why Scripture tells us that he had the money purse is because he liked to pilfer through the money. He didn't follow Christ for the right reasons. He's also one of the only disciples that we know came from an area outside of Galilee. Judas is the one that when the lady took the expensive oil and fragrance and put it on Christ and his feet and his hair, he was the one that criticized and said, man, do you know how much poor people we could have fed with all that money? That she just wasted on Jesus. The truth is, that's how we know he pilfered through the money because in his heart, he just wanted all that money. He's the one that when the priest wanted to turn on Christ and get Christ and to find him and to be able to capture him they approached Judas and they offered him 30 pieces of silver and like that he turned on him 
But what amazes me about Judas, even though Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss right there in the garden, Jesus still washed his feet. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget the Savior that you serve. He knew in his heart what G Judas was going to do. He knew from the beginning. Scripture is clear that he knew from the very beginning that Judas would be the one that betrayed. He referred to him as the son of perdition, which means son of damnation. That is who he was. And so here we have Judas, and Jesus still washed his feet. That's the servant heart of our Savior. That he would wash the feet of his betrayer, knowing that it's that night his betrayer would turn him over with a kiss. And yet he still got on his knees and washed Judas' feet. <clears throat> so what do all these men have in common? That's what I started off this part asking. What did each one of them have in common? Were they all fishermen? No. Did they all come from the same family? No. Did they all come from the same area? No. What is the one thing they all had in common? The one thing they all had in common is that each and every one of them was an utter failure. Every one of them was a failure. It was, I, I mentioned it when we started talking about Peter. Peter said, no, no, Jesus, all these guys over here may fail you, but I ain't never going to fail you. I'll die for you. Do you know what the passage says right after that? That every one of them around that table said, it ain't me. I'm not the betrayer. Every one of them said, I wouldn't leave you. But what happened at the Garden of Gethsemane? How many of them stuck around? How many of them stayed there and fought off the guards? How many of them went to the cross with Jesus? None of them. Because every one of them left him in the end. Every one of them deserted. Every one of them failed. And they failed multiple times. They either failed because of the way they spoke or they failed because of their little faith. Jesus would say it and we're going to get to it as we go through the Gospel of Mark. Time and time again, it's ye of little faith. Every one of them were utter failures. But here's the glorious part of it. That's the people he wanted. Don't forget how we started this passage. How did Jesus come to these twelve? He prayed all night long, and he said he chose those whom he himself wanted. He wanted those losers. That's what he wanted. He picked these 12 out of all the multitude. And I want you to see this. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, the beginning here of the new church, I want you to see what the Pharisees said. Acts chapter 4, 13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Do you know how many times I've heard people tell me, I can't serve or I'm not going to be able to share or I can't do this because I haven't been trained? No, you're just not walking with Christ. Because if you're walking with Christ, Everybody's going to see it. We see the apostles start leading people to Jesus the day they got with Christ. Because they are so utterly amazed at who he is, they don't need to go off to Bible college or a seminary to get trained to go and tell someone about Jesus. They just need to know what Jesus means to them. And that's what we see in Scripture. These were not educated men. This ain't nothing but some folks from Morgan County that fished on the Tennessee. That's who these people are. I want you to go on to see that that's exactly who we are. Every one of us has failed him. How many of us in this room have sinned? Every one of us. How many of us have at one time or another denied Christ? The truth is, every one of us, whether you realize it or not, either in your actions or in your inactions, we have all denied Him at one time or another. Every one of us is in the same boat. Every one of us has betrayed Him through our actions or inactions. 
We have willingly known if you've given your life to Christ that at some point knowing the sacrifice he's made for you and the commands and the will that he has for your life and you have willingly said, not today, Jesus, I'm doing it my way. Then give him a kiss with Judas. Every one of us is the same. Every one of us has fallen into the same categories. We've had moments of doubt, just like Thomas. That's why I said every one of us will have to apologize to him, because how many times have you doubted your faith? How many times have you doubted, will Christ be there for you this time? My marriage is falling apart, will Jesus save it? My life is falling apart, will Jesus save it? My career is gone, will Jesus give me and provide for me? The answer is yes, but we doubt. Boy, I know about, I don't know about you, but I know when I get to heaven, Thomas is the first one I'm going to see. And I'm going to say, brother, I'm sorry. We are all guilty of doing the same thing. How many times have we been like Peter, sitting around a fire or around a family event, and somebody began to bash faith or bash what Christians do or bash anything about when it comes to Christ or what Christ stands for, and we don't say a word. And they join Peter. Every one of us is the same way. Every one of us falls into the same category. But here's what I want you to understand. Every one of us is wanted. Every one of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 26 verse 28 says this. Brothers, consider the time of your calling. So what's he talking about when Jesus called you? Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble by birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. And he chose the lowly and the despised things of this world. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Welcome to being one of the foolish ones. Welcome to being one of the lowly ones. Welcome to this category of where he uses us to shame the wise. And the truth is, that's where we all are. How many of you are sitting in the mansion in White House right now? You're not. You don't have all this great power. You don't have all this great... Nobody's sitting there right now saying, Man alive, I wish I was so-and-so at Show Creek because they're so smart. We are not the greatest in the world. But he will take people like us and change the world. He took a lowly drunk who lost everything. And he slowly but surely gave me my life back. And he did it not because I'm great. Y'all do realize, and I shared this with somebody the other day. I, 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 I don't know how in the world. I think my high school counselor just loved me. Because I didn't even get the advanced diploma, y'all. I was a standard guy. I didn't want to take calculus. I didn't want to take all that stuff. So I got the standard diploma. And I still graduated closer to last on the standard diploma. And somehow I got an academic scholarship. I don't know who she bought off. But they sent me to Calhoun on an academic scholarship. And guess what? This old boy did in the first semester. Bye-bye. I kissed it goodbye. Because I wasted it. Do you know one of the classes I failed? Get ready. Public speaking. <laughs> Everybody wants to know why in the world... I fought my calling going in because how in the world could God take somebody that can fail a public speaking class at a community college and want him to be the preacher? Because God chooses the foolish things of this world. God chooses the lowly things of this world. God didn't just pick a guy that failed community speaking or public speaking. He picked a drunk that everybody was done away with. Be the guy that lost his job and lost his family and lost his home. That's who God will pick, and he'll use anybody. And if we would just simply humble ourselves and realize that he has chosen us, if you realize what he could do with your lives, 
All of us are guilty of this. We take the apostles and we put them up on these pedestals and we think, man, man, Peter, Peter, man, he, he's the rock. He, be, he becomes like the chief of the church. You got James, you got John, you got all these guys that were so great. Do you know what those guys were? Every one of them failed. None of the apostles thought they were great. They thought the same way that me and you think about each other. That, man, I don't think I can get through today. I, I yelled at somebody because they didn't turn on their turn signal. And I needed to turn. And I got this much time to get on 67. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just hang on and go that way after church. <laughs> and I have rough days and I have these bad thoughts in my head. And the truth is they did too. They didn't realize that they were going to be the apostles. They didn't realize that they were going to be great champions of the faith at that time. And I tell you, even though you currently are sitting there right now with all these doubts in your heads on how you cannot serve, you cannot share, you cannot be the person Christ wants you to be, and the truth is you are the exact person Christ wants you to be. You just need to step up and try. Just go and try. And you'll be amazed if we would just simply follow him. Every one of us. And so I want you to look at this real quick. Number one, first the disciples of Jesus Christ. If we're really going to be disciples, we've got to be close to him. We've got to be close to him. That's what we see here in our passage. Verse 14. And he appointed 12 of them so that they would what? Be with him. If we would simply be with Christ, if we would stay close to Jesus, He's the one that's going to change us. You're not going to change yourself. I'm a living example that you cannot change yourself. I tried to stop drinking for years, and I never could stop. To the point I lost it all, but there is one who changed me, and it's not because of my own strength. It's not because I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps or I just quit because everybody told me why can't you just quit I quit because Christ changed me I quit because I walked with him and I got close to him and he's the one that began to change me we must be close to him Jesus said this about his followers in Matthew 16 24 whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me the moment I actually started walking with Christ and got close to Jesus is the day that I finally said, I didn't want my life no more. Here it is. And I denied myself. And it was about His will. Does that mean I still walk according to His will every day? Absolutely not. I just told you about a turn signal incident a second ago. But you know that that turn signal incident got brought back to my mind during a time of prayer. Those thoughts, those things that I've done get brought back, and that's where I repent, and I just thank him for his love that he has for me. I strive to walk with him just as the apostles strive to walk, not because they were perfect. They just were willing to deny themselves and to seek his will for their lives and not their will for their lives. Most of us wonder why we don't walk in the power that we read about in Scripture. Because that's what it says in Acts 1.8 that we will have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. The reason why we don't walk in power is because we're not walking with Him. If we would walk with Him, then we'll walk in power. But when you're walking in your strength, when you're walking seeking your will, then you're not going to walk in that power. You're walking in your own power. And you'll get whatever you can do by yourself. But if you want to accomplish something that's not of this world, something that will leave those that are wise in awe, walk with him and see what he'll do. Be faithful to follow him and see what will actually happen. Do you know, everybody always wonders, and I'm going to say this real quick, real fast. Everybody wants to know why did the disciples fall. Have you ever thought about that, that Jesus is just walking by a seashore and tells somebody that's fishing, hey, come follow me. And they leave their boat and stuff. How many of you would do that? None. 
That seems crazy to me. How many of you are going to leave your daddy in the fishing boat when that's your livelihood? That seems crazy. James and John left Zebedee sitting in the boat. Levi left his tax collector's booth with all the money. You've got all these disciples that just get up and leave. Do you know why they did that? Because the culture that they live in is a theocratic culture. It's, a, it's all about theology. And those that are in true power in Israel were the priests. You would become a part of the Sanhedrin, the, the rulers of that area. And so everybody went to Bible college basically as a child. Everybody started going to school to learn Scripture. But after about the age of seven or eight, they'd have a time where they would test them. And if you were really, really smart, you'd go to the next level, like middle school. But if you weren't really smart, guess what? You went back home and you did whatever your parents did for a living. And of that middle school, they'd take an even smaller little fraction, and that's who would become the priest and the scribes. Only the best of the best. And they would sit there and petition another priest to be their disciple. And so if you really wanted to be someone, you had to be the smartest of the smartest, and you had to have a disciple, a true guy, pick you as his disciple, is what I'm saying. And if you did that, you would be somebody in Israel. And here you have... A man like Christ who's doing all these miracles, speaking like no one had ever spoke before. And he walks up to a Peter, to an Andrew, to a James, to a John, to a Levi, to a Nathaniel or Bartholomew. He goes up to all of them. And every one of them dropped out in elementary school. And he says, I want you. Yeah, that's why they left it all. Because they couldn't imagine being anything greater than to follow Christ. That's why they did it. And I want you to understand just how powerful it is that when Christ wants you, that people are willing to walk away from everything. Because nobody can imagine following someone greater. The second thing that he sees that a disciple does is they're called to speak truth. Every one of them is called to speak truth. Think about it for a second. Why did Jesus actually call them? It says it right there in your passage. To preach. Every one of us is called to teach. Every one of us is called to share. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I know, wait a minute, Brother Mailer. God didn't call me to teach no Sunday school class. How'd that work out for you, Mickey? How'd that work out for you, Dennis? I'll tell you how it worked out for me. You see what I'm doing. I'll tell you how it worked out for Moses, too, when he said he couldn't speak. I'll tell you from everybody else that ever said they couldn't do something. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Now, wait a minute, Brother Malin. I, I ain't been called <coughs> to teach. All right. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of their practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. What are they practicing? The word. They're studying it. Guess what they're able to teach? The word. Because they're studying it. They're practicing it. Guess what? Every, understand that when Hebrews is writing that, he didn't pause there before he started in verse 12 and said, this is only for those that I'm going to call to be missionaries and preachers. That's not what he said. Paul's getting on to them because he have all these new believers, and now it's been a while since they've been saved, and guess what? they still the same way they were when they got saved. They ain't no different. They hadn't learned nothing. They have sat there, for cultural reference, they've sat in a pew for the last 20 years and they ain't never stepped up to do nothing. They're still needing a bottle. To give you an example, when I had a child, my child would scream until I gave him a bottle and I'd feed him. 
But now, guess what? My son gets up. He fixes his own bowl of cereal. He don't scream for me no more. My daughter, every now and then, will scream. But because I didn't have the right food. But the point is simply that I'm making is this, and you all know it really well. They mature, and they're growing up, and they're learning how to fix their own food. And that's what Paul's saying right there. We've got a whole lot of people in this world that profess to follow Christ, and yet today they are no closer to following him and no wiser in his word than the day they got called. They're still crying, hoping somebody will teach them something. I did not get saved until I was 27. I was a late bloomer. And it's because of my own stubbornness. But I have been growing in the knowledge of his word every day. Because I hunger for it. I want to know the life of the man that saved me. I want to know the life of the man that changed my life. I want to know how he affects me. And it, it's a passion in me, and it burns, and I just got to know. I got to know more about him. I never dreamed in a million years that I would teach somebody, but that's what I've been called to do, and I want you to hear me well. Every one of you has been called to do it. In Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, we refer to this as the Great Commission. Have you ever read the Great Commission? Therefore, go and make the disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and what? Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus Christ did not say that just to preachers and missionaries. The Great Commission is for all His followers. Every one of us. And that doesn't, uh, do not walk out of here saying, well, Brother Moses says i got to teach a Sunday school. No, that's between you and Christ. But I will say this. Every one of you are called to be able to take that blessed book right there and be able to walk to anybody up on that street and show them in the gospel how Jesus Christ died for them. That's what that commandment is saying. And if you cannot sit there and share your faith through Scripture, then you are a babe in Christ and you still need someone to feed you. But you need to grow and mature in your word to be able to teach others. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3 that says that we are to give a reason for the hope that is in us. But do it with gentleness and kindness. Give a reason to who? Anybody that asks why you're different. And so that means share your testimony. Well, I ain't got a testimony like you. Yes, you do. Jesus Christ saved your soul just like he did mine. And I've already talked about when we were going through Levi, every one of us is just as wretched as the next person. You just might not have done as many horrible things as I did. And, it, and you better thank God for it because you're just not as stubborn as I am. He just had to break me until I gave in. But every one of us is called to grow, so we are called to speak truth. Lastly, we are to fight the enemy. Disciples of Jesus Christ are called to fight the enemy. That's exactly what it says in this passage, that we will have authority over demons, over evil. Now, a lot of us are sitting there thinking, wait a minute now, I, I ain't all sure about that whole demon thing. Let me, let me explain something to you. I'm a firm believer in angels. I believe in angels with all my heart. Scripture says that we actually entertain them without us even knowing it. They're here. They walk among us. They're here. But if I believe in angels, guess what else I must believe in? The ones that fail. We call them demons. And they're here too. Now, I don't believe that it's the same as you see on TV where you got everybody acting crazy and everything else floating in the air and all that good stuff. I don't see that in Scripture. But I do believe that the enemy is around. I'll give you one of my favorite stories is the seven sons of Sceva. Most of you probably never heard that story, but it's in the book of Acts. There's seven old boys that heard uh, Paul preaching the gospel, and he's defeating the enemies and said, you know what? We can do that. We might make some money at it. So these seven brothers go out, and they find a man that's possessed by a demon. And they walk up to him, and he says, 
on the authority of Jesus that the apostle Paul preaches, we're going to cast you out. And the demon looked at him and said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but I don't know you. See, they tried to cast him out, and they didn't have faith to begin with. And that story goes on to be pretty comical because that one demon-possessed man whipped the seven men and beat them to the point they didn't have no clothes on them and they got ran off naked. It's a hilarious story. But it does speak to a truth. If you are going to have power over the enemy, you first got to have the power of Christ. He's got to be in you. That's why we started with you got to be with him. You got to grow in his word. And then you have authority over the evil one. I say this all the time to folks. You let the drunk and you let the addict, you let whoever it is that's struggling in their lives, whether it comes with greed or when it comes to gambling or when it comes to just any kind of sin that has us captivated, come to church and grow in his word, grow in your relationship with him. And then guess what? You will overcome the evil. They let me, a drunk, sit in the back pew of a church for a long time. Because you don't sober the drunk up before you get him to church. Just get him to church. And let God do the sobering. His word never returns void. And so we continue to speak in truth. Knowing that it won't return in void. But understand it's him who actually has the power. James chapter 4 verse 7 says this. Submit, therefore, to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, what do you got to do first? Submit. That's that whole deny yourself and follow him. Then you can defeat him. It was only when I gave my life to Christ, it's only when I started serving him and following him that I began to have the ability to overcome the evil that's in my life. And it wasn't because of who I am or because of my strength. It's because of his strength inside of me. Do you remember, there's another story we find in the little bitty book of Jude there at the end of the Bible where the archangel Michael actually confronted Satan over the body of Moses. And how did the archangel Michael defi- uh, fight Satan? He didn't say, by my authority and might, I'm going to whip you, old Lucifer. He didn't say, I'm the better archangel. He said, the Lord rebukes you. I, when I fight the evil of this world, when I fight the sins in my life and the things trying to bring me down, I don't rebuke them in my strength. I rebuke them in His. I fight them through the strength that He has given me. That's why in 1 John 4, 4 it says, And you are from God, little children. You have overcome them because greater is He is in you than he that is of this world. It's not you that's greater. See, that's a man-centered gospel. That says you just get on better and you just strengthen yourself. No, no, dear children, you listen to me. It's he that is greater. And when you invite him into your heart, then things begin to change. When you make him Lord of your life, things begin to change. And so closing is simply this. You are chosen. Each and every one of you. You're wanted. You are desired. You have been set apart. Jesus said in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give to you. I hear that last part of that said all the time, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. Do you know what I don't ever hear? Is that first part. That you will bear fruit. And you'll do it in whose name? His. Every one of us are chosen. 1 Peter 2.9, Peter said this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of Him who has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Y'all, that's basically the same passage I just read to you. You are coming up out of darkness. Why? Because He has chosen you. And he's got a purpose for you. What's your purpose? To proclaim his glory and excellence. The same message from Genesis to Revelation. We are chosen. We are wanted. And we are chosen and wanted for a purpose. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Just as he chose us 
in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be a holy and blameless before Him. In Him, in love, He predestined in us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ Himself, according to the kind intention of His own will. It's His will that He chose us. And when did He choose us? From the foundation of the world. Do you know what that tells me? That my Savior knew every little thing I was going to do. He knew every little sin, every little thought, everything. And he still wanted me. And he still gave his life for me. And he did it for you too. Every one of you. So don't walk out of here today and say, man, I wish I was wanted. I wish I was desired. Every one of you are. Don't walk out of here today and say, I, I'm, I'm not smart enough. I failed. I've got too much sin in my life. They did too. That's why I love the apostles. They give me encouragement. That every time I stub my toe, that I too can be an ambassador to him in this fallen world. And be the light and the salt that he determined for me to be. And that he's determined for each and every one of us to be. You are wanted today. And that's the message I want you to go and tell Priceville and everybody you run into. That they are wanted by a Savior that gave his life for them regardless of what they've done or how great they are because it's about how great he is let's pray